But firepower alone isn't going to win the ridge. They also need to understand the battlefield inside and out. They need to know every single inch of Vimy Ridge. Deep in the vaults of the Canadian War Museum, a forgotten piece of history, a detailed 3D model of the ridge, likely used for planning by the battle's masterminds, British commander Julian Bing and his Canadian general, Arthur Curry. They are essentially cardboard layered underneath topographical maps so that the contour intervals of the ground are shown. So you can actually get a sense of how the land slopes up toward Vimy Ridge and a good sense of the steepness of the backside. This is the German side. Uh, if you look at the ground, you know, you're attacking uphill everywhere. But it, it is a very much a dominating piece of ground. Uh, if you're sitting up on Vimy Ridge, you can see for miles. If you have an enemy that can see miles behind your front lines, it, it's pretty hard to sneak up on them. In the most ambitious and thorough training program of its time, Bing and Curry used such maps to build a four-mile full-scale replica in France to train its men. In the run-up to the battle, Canadian soldiers will practice here without stop. But the training is not only done overseas. At home, soldiers are trained in the latest techniques in trench warfare on a specially designed facility near Shiloh, Manitoba. Near that same facility, modern soldiers recently back from Afghanistan practice a crucial tactic used at Vimy, the creeping barrage. We're here at Camp Hughes Provincial Heritage Site in Manitoba. Almost 30,000 Canadian soldiers were trained in these trenches and most of those men went on to take Vimy Ridge. Canadian soldiers perfecting the creeping barrage could only imagine what that first day at Vimy would really be like. So the platoon is in the front line trenches and they're ready to go. Soon you're going to see a flash of muzzles across the back of the horizon as over a thousand guns open fire to support the Canadian troops and 130 machine guns are firing in this barrage. An avalanche of steel coming over the heads of the troops as they go over the top. In the past at Vimy, the Allies had only used artillery to strike the enemy. But Bing and Curry have another idea. They decide to use that firepower to protect troops while they physically charge the Germans, throwing down a wall of shells only slightly ahead of them. The soldiers are going to spread out into no man's land and they're going to get themselves oriented on the German trenches. In real life, they would be trained to keep as close to our barrage as they possibly could. The British had used the creeping barrage in the past, but timing had been a problem. Advance too slowly and the artillery will not offer proper cover, advance too quickly, and men fall to friendly fire. Low air burst. Shrapnel was normally burst 75 yards from the German trenches. The Canadians burst it at only 25 yards, nice and low, so it can't hurt our own troops. The troops are trained to get as close as possible to the line of shrapnel, which is marked by white puff clouds of smoke in front of them. They get down and now they're going to wait until the barrage lifts. And these guys are going to get up and clear those German trenches. But the creeping barrage can only work if the soldiers know where the enemy is located on the field. To do that, they need help from above, from the second dimension of the battle for Vimy Ridge. January 1917, 6,000 feet over Vimy Ridge. With only three months left before the Canadian attack, German and Allied airmen meet in what is the new battlefield of the First World War, the skies. It's only been 13 years since the Wright brothers showed the world that man can fly. And in Canada's master plan, 
The skies are a big part of winning the ridge. When we think about aircraft from the First World War, you think about the, the Red Baron flying around, shooting down other aircraft. Well, that's one job. The most important job, frankly, was observation. And those observation aircraft were, were two-man aircraft, pilot and observer. The observer was a gunner for defense, and he has a camera. And his job is to take photographs, a mosaic, taking them one after another as they fly over a piece of ground. So that way they can keep a record of how the German positions are changing, are the batteries there, are the targets for artillery. One of the air observers is Dudley Holmes from Godrich. The 22-year-old son of a successful lawyer, Dudley Holmes is trained as an observer in England in the hope of soon becoming a full-fledged pilot. Few have ever seen the world from the air. Dudley and others do it under the worst possible conditions. Visible landmarks are all they have to guide them. These people are facing an incredible array of danger from the ground, from enemy aircraft, from simply crashing, and a lot of aircraft are lost by that. And their life expectancy is extremely short. In fact, it's far more dangerous being in the aircraft than it is being an infantry officer in the trenches. Observers like Dudley are also responsible for coordinating artillery strikes, but it's not clear how they were able to communicate with the ground below. To answer that question, Terry LaBelle, a former jet pilot with the Canadian Forces Snowbirds, and Captain Chuck Roeder take to the air in a plane similar to that flown over Vimy. For both men, it's a long way from a supersonic jet. Dudley Holmes would have been 21, 22 years old by the time he got into an aircraft. He probably hasn't seen a whole heck of a lot of them ever in his life. He looks at this thing, it's canvas covered, it's wood tube and fabric. There isn't, there's not a lot to inspire a great deal of confidence. Uh, you can try it that way. <laughs> keep coming, keep coming, you're doing fine. He probably really wanted to be a pilot, but he has to go through the observer phase first before they'll accept him as a pilot. So he's got to do this thing. He's got to grit his teeth and get this job done before he gets to go on and do what he really wants to do with another guy driving the airplane. Completely new environment. It's like you and I going into space. Oh, my God. That is just amazing. Okay, try it this way. I'm six foot. I can't imagine uh, <coughs> a guy bigger than me or heavier set than me trying to climb into this monster. While the observation plane scouts above, on the ground, the troops get into position. Lower! Advance! At an artillery range in Shiloh, Manitoba, Modern soldiers try their hand at a 1917 air-to-ground artillery mission. To do it right, they bring in very real and very lethal 32-pound shells and a 105-millimeter howitzer, the modern equivalent of the guns used at Vimy. In the air, the observer pinpoints a German bunker on the ridge. All he has to do now is communicate down the target position. But in 1917, he has no phones, no satellites, no computers, no walkie-talkies. Basically, we have a, a Morse code, and all I'm going to do is strap it to my leg so that I can send appropriate information back to the ground. And we have another unit similar to this on the ground where somebody's going to receive the data for the first time ever, the planes at Vimy are fitted with wireless radio transmitters that allow them to send down the signal. It's the world's first electronic battlefield. <laughs> 